Today, I, I have the privilege of being able to stand and kick off a series of sermons and talks that will be a continuation of what we saw God do at the Batwell Auditorium this past weekend. You guys know that Pastor Mike gave us a clarion call to travel back to the one. And I want to give a disclaimer this morning that this will not be a shouting sermon. It won't be uh, a sexy sermon, but it might just be a strategic sermon. You may not shout, but I believe you will get better. In the book of Revelation, uh, we see seven letters that are written to the churches, and these churches can be understood in a myriad of ways. They can be understood literally because these are seven literal churches that were at work and operating in the world at this time. They could also be understood figurator figuratively, that maybe this was a figurative message that the writer was attempting to send to all churches. They could also be understood prophetically, that this may not have been a problem that was going on within these churches at the time, but the writer was inspired by God to send this message to help prevent and cure future problems. And I want to begin by making this statement, and I pray you write this down. It's not on the screens, but I do want you to put it in your notes. God is and will always be a God of passion. It was A.W. Towser who said, and I quote, God dwells in a state of perpetual enthusiasm. God dwells in a state of perpetual enthusiasm. What do you mean, Hollis? In Matthew 21, Jesus was enraged by those who had turned the temple into a marketplace. The Bible says he got so mad that he took a whip and he drove out everybody who was buying and selling. Why? Because God dwells in a state of perpetual enthusiasm. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit came like a mighty rushing wind and sat on them like tongues of fire. Why? Because God is and will always be a God of passion. And when he does something, he does it passionately. In John 11, Jesus is moved by the sufferings of his friends to such a degree that the Bible says two words that have always messed me up. Jesus wept. Because God dwells in a perpetual state of enthusiasm. When God does something, he does it passionately. In Numbers 32, the Bible says that God's anger burned against the rebellious Israelites. Why? Because God dwells in a perpetual state of enthusiasm. What's the good news in that, Pastor Hollis? This means to you and I that God is always giving all of us all of him. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. Why is this good news for us? Because it means that God is always giving all of us all of him. Which means that he can be in Forestdale blessing and increasing and enlarging your territory. But because he gives all of us all of him all the time, he can be in Forestdale doing the same things he's doing in Fairfield. He can be in Birmingham doing the same thing that he's doing in Brooklyn. Y'all are not hearing me, that God gives all of us, all of him, all the time. You ever knew somebody, and it was like they were doing something, but you could tell they weren't doing it with all of them? I, th I think it might have been uh, the gospel of OJ's when he said, your, your body's here with me. But your mind... Oh, y'all ain't saved. I thought y'all was back to the one. Y'all ain't saved. They were attempting to communicate that it's possible for you to be in a place physically, but not be in that place mentally or emotionally or spiritually. And I believe the writer here in the book of Revelation would be saying the same thing to some of us, that your body is here with me. But your mind and your money and, and, and your thoughts and your best energy and effort is somewhere else. And what grieves the heart of God more than anything is a church that will worship him with their lips. Say amen or say ouch. But your heart is far from me. Your heart is far from me. And church, what I'm trying to get you to understand is, 
is that when we look at the character and the nature of God, we can break down God's nature and characteristics into two categories, one of which is incommunicable, incommunicable. These are things that can only be said about God, that God is omnipotent. That means he's all-powerful, that he's omniscient. That means he's all-knowing, that he's omnipresent which means he can be here and there at the same time, which means he can be with you and your family without, have to, without having to leave me and my family. I got to teach that class when to shout. He's also omnibenevolent. I snuck you with that one. That means he's all good. Not only do we see that God has incommunicable traits, but, but church, he also has communicable traits. These are things that can be said about God and us. That God is patient. So guess what? With your impatient self. That means if you try really, 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 really hard, you can be patient too. He's loving. And because this is a communicable trait, this means that the closer we get to God and we engage within a, within a theological construct called sanctification, that we should begin to take on the characteristics and nature of God. Which means that when somebody cuts you off in traffic, he's generous and he's passionate. He's passionate. It was E. M. Forrester who said, one person with passion is more powerful than 40 people who are merely interested. What he was saying is, is, is that it's your passion that makes you powerful. Y'all didn't hear me. It's your passion that is what really makes you powerful. You want to know how you've been able to accomplish all that you've been able to accomplish even though you didn't have the best start and you didn't have all of the advantages that they had. You weren't born in a sil- with a silver spoon in your mouth. You weren't born on the right side of the tracks. You had to struggle and you had to fight and you had to figure it out. But why have you been able to accomplish all that you've been able to see in your life? It's because of your passion. See, when you're passionate, you will show up early, but then you'll stay late. When you're passionate, negativity and hard times and difficulty is not enough to make you quit. Why do you keep going? Why are you resilient? Why do you keep bouncing back? Because there is an innate passion in you that makes you keep going even when you want to quit. You ever sat in your car outside of work and mentally typed up your resignation letter? Oh, it's just me. Per my last email, we had discussed various inconsistencies within the culture here and climate of the office. You had planned it all out. And you got out the car and you put on I'm about to quit walk and you walked through the office and you spoke to people that you ain't spoke to in a year. And you sat down at that, at that cubicle and you start thinking about your daughter's gymnastics and that your son needed some shoes and that that rent or that mortgage had to be paid. And you start thinking about how you like doing this and something actually happened. And because you are passionate about being able to provide for your children and your family and your household, you forced yourself to stick out in something that you really wanted to quit. What am I trying to get you to understand? That when you have passion, passion is so powerful that it will help you to be able to do things that you didn't think you would be able to do. It will help you to be able to go past the point that you thought was going to be the place where you would quit. And what I came back here to do this morning is to help you get your passion back. That you will not step in this room, that you will not log in online and go through the motions for another day or another week or another night. God, we want our passion back. We want to be able to praise you. 
like you open doors, worship you like you changed our life, give like we know that there's something on the other side of it. God, we want our passion back. Because what the devil is most afraid of is a, the passionate version of you. Not that old dry, <laughs> boring, tired, lazy. Not that version of you. No, he's scared of that version of you that'll work your nine to five, and when you clock out of your nine to five, you'll clock into your dream. He, he's not afraid of that, that, that you that gives God a quick 30-second uh, prayer when you wake up in the morning. No, he, he, he's afraid of that version of you that used to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and pace the floor, laying hands on your children and speaking those things that were not as though they were. God, we want our passion back. And in today's text, we get a chance to meet a church that, like many of us, has gotten to a point in a place where they need their passion. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 through 4, I know all the things you do. I've seen your, your hard work and your patient endurance. I know that you don't tolerate evil people. You've examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You've even patiently suffered for me without quitting, but I have this complaint against you. You've lost your passion. You don't love me or each other. Uh-oh. As you did at first. I'm going to tell you what God has convicted me of. That you think being a good Christian and you think that adequately following God is you expressing your love for him. When what he says is, the problem I've got with you is that you can't love me and not love them. You ever been friends with somebody who didn't like your other friends? And so now when you want to hang out with them and feel like you keep, you're cheating on them, and so then you can't, you can't really post nothing when you was with this group of friends because then that group of friends going to get mad. Y'all be cheating on y'all friends like that? Jesus. And then every once in a while, you're like, man, come on, man. She ain't like that. She cool, bro. And so then you'll invite the one friend that the other friends don't like to come to the thing that all the other friends going to, and then she can feel that, that they don't really like them, so then she just sit in the corner the whole time, and now you feel guilty for having fun. Seriously, folks, or should I say spiritually, folks, maybe sometimes that's how God feels when he's sitting in heaven. And you worshiping me, but you're talking crazy about them. You gave an offering, but wouldn't give him a ride. He says, what I have against you is that you don't love me or each other the way you used to. You've lost your passion. Put verse 2 back up there. He says, oh, you've done all the right things. I know all the things you do. I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance. You fed the hungry and you clothed the naked. You did gas giveaways. But you ain't really loving me or them the way you used to. You came to church. You read your daily devotion. You woke up at 721. You didn't get out of bed, but you woke up. You're doing all the right things, but your heart ain't in it. I pray 
that you guys can see how seriously this is really weighing on me because I'm not telling you what I've heard. I'm not telling you what I sat in a class and heard a professor tell me or what I listened to another preacher try to convince me of. I'm telling you that I know what it feels like to be operating at the peak of what God has called you to do and your heart not in it. Y'all don't want to talk like that. To preach and God move and people get saved and you go home and you don't even know if God is pleased because your heart ain't in it. He says, you have done the things. And can we be honest for a moment, church, we know how to do the things. We know how to do the things. How are you doing? I'm looking for a job that'll you know, be able to expand my leadership capabilities. Depressed. Showing up to PTA meetings and you regret having kids. Going on vacation and really you just want to go to sleep. Because you're doing the things but your heart not in it. Because you've lost your passion. You've lost your passion. He says, you have done the things that's right there. He said, you've examined the claims of those that, that say they're apostles, but are not. You've discovered that they are liars. You've even suffered. You mean to tell me I can suffer for God and have lost my passion to be with him? This message is being, is being sent to the church at Ephesus. I did my homework. The church of Ephesus was at this point the fourth largest city in the world. It was a free port in the Roman capital, which means that Roman troops did not garrison there, which means they had nothing to stop them from ships coming and going as they wanted to. And because they were a free port with no military presence, they could trade back and forth as much as they wanted to. So not only were they large, but they also had money. They were influential. In fact, this may have been at this time the most large, that may have been the largest, most influential church in the world. God was not concerned about the things they had been doing because they had done it all. He wasn't worried that they had mishandled their purpose. He was concerned that they had misplaced their passion. <sighs> Y'all not hearing me. Because purpose determines what you do. But passion determines how you do it. Which means it's possible to be in purpose without passion. They don't have purpose problems. They have passion problems. And few things in life are as frustrating as being in purpose with no passion. They were doing the things, but the heart wasn't in it. The, the Ephesians, I pray you can handle this, the Ephesians, the Ephesians had high levels of activity, but low levels of intimacy. They were highly active, but barely intimate. They were doing a lot for God, except for actually being with God. Y'all don't like this. Y'all don't like this. It's tight, but it's right. And church, what I'm trying to do is, is I'm trying to show you my own scars. I'm trying to show you my own life. I'm, I'm only sharing with you what I am convinced in my heart that God has shared with me, that, that over the course of, of, of back to the one and praying in the presence of God, I, I, I walk out of that place with a renewed passion, but also with a renewed conviction. That many of us are teetering on the edge of burnout in various places of our lives. Because we have engaged in high levels of activity and low levels of intimacy. 
And family, can I tell you something? And this is probably the first time I've ever said this in my entire preaching career. I've been preaching the gospel over 10 years of my life. And this is the first time that I'm going to say this and really mean it. I don't care if you say amen today. I do not care. I don't care. Because God is calling us to a deeper level of intimacy. God, when I pray, I want things to happen. God, when I worship, I want to feel things lift off of me. When I begin to lift my hands, I want you to come into the room. God, I want to be able to walk into a room with somebody that's sick, and I want to be able to lay hands on them, and they recover. I want to be able to go to my baby's school and walk around and pray, and not a gunman or anybody can be able to walk in there and do anything that is not in alignment with the Word of God. Who in the room and online wants their passion back? I want to be able to speak those things that are not as though they were. I want to be able to be the Moses of my family that when I come out, I reach back and I get everybody else out too. Is there anybody under the sound of my voice who's ready to get your passion back? I want my passion back. Because my passion it's what makes me powerful. The devil is afraid of you, not because you're cute, not because you got degrees, but because you got a fire that's burning on the inside of you. That like Jeremiah, I'm not going to worship, I'm not going to preach, I don't know, I'm tired of church, I'm not going back, no, I'm done, they done did me wrong too many times, but Jeremiah said that it's like fire that has been shut up in my bones, and I just start itching and fidgeting and burning, why? Because when God puts a fire on the inside of you, there is nothing that the devil can do that should be able to extinguish it. The Bible even says in the book of Leviticus when they're given the Levitical law and God commands them, he says, the fire on the altar must never go out. I believe that's Leviticus chapter 6. He says, no, I want you to wake up and I want you to take some wood and I want you to throw it on the fire because no matter what happens, that fire can't go out. It's got to keep burning. Because it's that fire that's going to push you back to me. It's that fire that's going to make you pray. It's that fire that's going to make you give. It's that fire that's going to make you love your enemies. It's that fire. And he says, I cannot allow you to engage in high levels of activity and low levels of intimacy. Jesus practiced this in his own ministry. And I'm convinced that so many times we want to mimic and copycat Jesus for his divinity, but we refuse to try to duplicate his devotion. So you want to do the miracles. <laughs> you want signs and wonders, but you don't want to pick up your word. You want to walk on water, but you don't want to walk across the hall and be nice. Jesus, the Bible says, regularly withdrew from the crowds and he found solitary places to pray. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the weight of the world is on his shoulders and the Bible says that he goes into that garden, he leaves his disciples and he goes a little further and the Bible says he begins to pray. Immediately after feeding the 5,000, he puts his disciples on a boat and sends them over to the other side. And the Bible says that he climbs up the mountain. And guess what he does? Prays. Because he said, even though I am the son of God, I refuse to do so much work for him that I don't have any time left to be with him. And what I'm trying to tell you, church, in the room online is that if you're going to engage in high levels of activity, you've got to engage in even higher levels of intimacy. Yeah. High levels of intimacy. I got, I got to hurry. I got to give you a couple things and then I'm going to get out of your way. The Ephesians had high levels of activity but low levels of intimacy. They, they were engaging in the power of the Spirit but had neglected the pace of the Son. 
The church there in Ephesus was a well-known church, a large city. It had been started by the Apostle Paul himself. He stayed there for three years, and then he left his son in the ministry, Timothy, there to lead the church. Timothy was a young and inexperienced leader. He did not seem like the logical choice to take over such a large and affluent church. He was young and inexperienced. He didn't have the pedigree and the degrees and all the other stuff that people have. And so it was unlikely that God would call him to do that. You don't see yourself in the text yet? Because I believe that what Timothy lacked in pedigree, he made up for in passion. I don't have a degree, but I got the devotion. I don't have the experience, but I've got the enthusiasm. I may not have the plan, but I got the passion. Paul leaves him there, and and look at what he says to him in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. Timothy is the leader of the church at Ephesus, and Paul, his spiritual father, his pastor, his leader, writes to him in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. He says, when I left for Macedonia, I urged you to stay there in Ephesus. You missed it. You missed it. Colleen, they, they missed it. Jesus When I left for Macedonia, I urged you to stay there. He said, I want you to stay there. Because too many times we want to shout about all the times that passion makes you step out. I want to take the road less traveled. Because passion also helps you stay put. He says, I urged you to be passionate enough to sit your behind down. I'm not done working on you yet. Sit down. I know they're cute, but they're not the one. Sit down. They got money, but they ain't really got you in mind. Sit down. Stay put. It look good, but it ain't going to be good. Sit down. It's a lot of money, but you ain't going to ever be able to go to church. They're going to have you working on Sundays. Stay put. You've had your mama, all, all the mamas. Did, did, you, ever, you didn't have to even say it. You ever been fussed at and nothing came out? Passion does not just help you step out. It also helps you to stay put. And sometimes God will ask you to be passionate enough to stay where you at. They working you like the CEO, only paying you like the janitor, but stay put. Got this marriage ain't working out. I want to get out of it. I'm tired. I'm frustrated. Stay put. God, I'm ready to go. It, 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 my time is up. You know, we start spiritualizing. Now, it's more that you put in me. It's ministry in me. How's ministry in you there, but it wasn't no ministry in you here? problem is, thank you, Holy Spirit. The problem is, is, is that we think that waiting time is wasted time. And even though I'm waiting, I'm not wasting because I'm still working. While I'm waiting on the job that I want, I'm working on the job that I have. While I'm waiting on my spouse, I'm working on myself. So even though I'm waiting, I'm not wasting because I never stop working. And it is possible for you to use your passion to stay in the place that you are while you are working on the place that God has called you to be. Stay put. Y'all didn't like that. That is not what y'all came here for. Amen. Hallelujah. Stay put. All right? 
He's encouraging Timothy to be passionate enough about his assignment to stick it out and stay put. All right? Here's a warning. Here's a warning. Wisdom often comes in the form of warnings. Can y'all receive that? All right? If passion only helps you to step out, but it never convinces you to stay put, then that's not passion. It's preference. Say amen and say ouch. If all your passion does is convince you that it's time to leave, that ain't passion. Baby, that's preference. And at any point that you don't get what you prefer, you think it's time for you to pick something else. You don't really know if you love something or somebody until you've had to love them when it hurts you. I am in the wrong church this morning. But I'm trying to get you to understand that if you are truly passionate, then sometimes passion makes you step into the fire and stay your behind in it and realize that maybe God is not trying to get you out because he's really trying to get in it with you. So that way you can stick it out a little while longer. Come in, Daniel, in the lion's den. God did not get him out. He left him in it, but he gave him peace in the middle of the pit because he had some passion. And you can have peace while everything around you is going crazy. Not because you got it all together, but because you got some passion on the inside of you. Because my passion helped me to stay put. I want to move, but I can't. I got to stay put. Because I'm passionate enough to remain. Some words to get me fired up. Start talking about remain. Stay. Become rooted. Grounded. The Bible says like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. That tree can't get up every time it stops raining where it's at. It's got to stay rooted long enough and realize that the same God that made it rain here two weeks ago, he'll make it rain here today and I'm going to stay put because I've been planted. You're going to catch it in a minute. You're going to get it in a minute. And you're going to get so fired up. And you're going to get so on fire and so excited and filled with so much enthusiasm. And your faith going to start rising and going to another level. Why? Because you're going to realize that God has given you the anointing, not just to step out, but he's also anointed me to be able to stay put. Anointed me to stay put. But look at what else he says to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, he says, So flee youthful passions. Because, church, can I tell you that passion is a paradox? Because all passions are powerful, but all passions aren't productive. He says, Timothy, I love you. You're my son in the ministry. I I see God's hand on your life. You're going to do amazing things, but you got to leave some stuff. (sighs) You got to flee youthful passions. Church, church, he does not say Sinful passions. It's just youthful. It ain't wrong. It's just wrong for where you are now. Can I tell you what you doing was okay when you were there, but it ain't okay while you're here. And it won't be okay 
here, it might be okay here, but it won't be okay if you're going to get there. Flee youthful passions. Church, there was some stuff that I was passionate about when I was younger that made me impressive. When I was a kid, I was into those RC rally cars, those, 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 those cars with the remote. I had all kind of cars. I mean, I just, I loved it. I had the Viper and the Corvette. I mean, I used to go outside and shut it down. <laughs> I had them all. I mean, what you want? <laughs> What's up, baby? <laughs> she want to ride? What's up, man? <laughs> yeah, my garage like a dealership, girl. But now as an adult, as a husband, a father, a pastor, a preacher, a leader, a staffer here at Rock City, if I'm still as passionate <laughs> about toy cars, but never go get an oil change on my real car, then that's no longer impressive. Now I just kind of seem immature. He says, flee youthful passions. It's not, it may not be sinful, it's just youthful. It's not wrong, it's just wrong for who you are now. It fit you before. But you've outgrown it. It worked. You ever went out with your friend? I'm gonna preach the ladies for a second. And she put on an outfit that, like, would have fit, like, like when y'all first met, but, like, now it's like the J-Baz anointing. God is, like, enlarged. Or, like, when David is getting ready to rush to the battle lines to fight Goliath, and Saul says, if you're going to fight, you got to put on this. But David says, I'm more comfortable winning like that. It don't fit. It ain't wrong, it's just wrong for me. He says, flee from youthful passions. Why? Because all passions are powerful, but not all passions are productive. And passion must be submitted to and in alignment with God's will for your life. God, don't just make me passionate for what I want to be passionate about. God, make me passionate about what you call me to be about. The Bible says that he who desires the office of a bishop desires a good thing. And in church, we always talk about somebody who's called to ministry, but we don't spend enough time about people who desire ministry. Because there's a lot of people that got the call but don't have the desire. I know God called me, but I don't want it. Passion must be submitted to and in alignment with God's plan for your life. So here's the prayer you're going to pray. Father, give me the passions that you desire for me to have. Make me passionate about your plan for my life. God, make me passionate about what you desire for my life. Pastor Hollis, that sounds good. But how in the world do I get my passion back? Thank you for asking. I never thought you would. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. He says, remember, not regret. Because regretting it ain't going to help you get it back. And too many of us are trapped in regret, regretting the passion that we once had, regretting what could have happened had we not done that, where we could be if they had did this or if that had went this way. He doesn't say regret it. He just says, remember it. I want you to get a picture of where you used to be in God, where, 
how you used to pray and how you used to give and, and remember that. And if you can remember it, then maybe you can get back to it. See, Pastor Mike taught me that remember, remember. You break that word down in two to be able to truly understand what it means. That re means to do again. Member means to put together. Remember, put me back together. Put my passion back together. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. And do the first works. He doesn't say feel the feeling. He says do the work. Because you can't reduce passion to just the feeling. Because when you're passionate, you're passionate beyond what you feel in the moment. Passion allows you to overlook what you feel in the short term. So that you can build what you feel in the long term. Do the work. Do the work. Don't try to feel the feeling. I want you to do the work. Because passion is not always doing something because of what I feel. Passion is sometimes doing something in spite of what I feel. I'm not going to always be able to do the work because I feel like it. Sometimes passion is going to help me do the work because I don't feel like it. I love what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. I want to take you to the New King James Version. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left. Your first love. You didn't lose it. You left it. You didn't lose your passion. You left your passion. My daughter Ava is here with me. She wanted to come to church this morning, and so she's sitting on the front row, and uh, she's probably just going to love the fact that I'm putting her on my sermon. We bought her a little phone for Christmas last year, and she just loved this little phone. She just, y'all, it's really iPod touch, <laughs> but when she connect to Wi-Fi, she can like text and stuff, so she thinks it's a phone. <laughs> and like any eight-year-old, or like her 32-year-old father, she tends to lose things. She loses them. She gets so frustrated, so mad. I lost my phone. Daddy, where's my phone? And sometimes, to try to help teach her, when I see that she's lost it, I'll grab it and I'll put it in my pocket. Or I'll put it in my backpack. After a couple of days, she'll get so frustrated that eventually, even though she doesn't want me to know, she'll come to her father. And she'll say, Daddy, I lost my phone. And like a good father, once I see that she's looking for it, and once I see that she was humble enough to come to her father, I say, baby, you didn't lose it. You left it somewhere. 
and because I loved you enough I picked up what you had left and I kept it somewhere safe until you decided to humble yourself enough and despite your frustrations come to your father and say God I lost my passion pride has got you still sitting down I've lost my passion and I used to love this stuff and it used to make me want to wake up in the morning but now I can't even get out of the bed I lost my passion and I want it back and church I am trying to get you to understand in this room and online that you cannot get your passion back simply by looking for it on your own. You've got to go to the Father. Back to the one. And with your hands lifted, reaching for him. Father, give me my passion back. Everybody who can stand is standing. Give me my passion back. Give me my passion. I don't want to just be a mother. I want to be a passionate mother. I want to enjoy going to the games and to the recitals and to the meetings. I don't want to be sitting here grieving what I could have been doing in my life had I not had you. I want to be passionate. just be a preacher I want to be a passionate preacher when I stand on the stage I want people to see that my heart is on fire I want my passion back And in this room, everybody put your hands down for a moment. Every eye closed, even at home. Close your eyes. And if you've heard this message that we've preached and that we shared today, and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is for you, that you have lost your passion for God and for what God has called you to do and what you're supposed to be pursuing and building. Whatever I close, I just want you to reach your hands as high as you can. Come on, put them in the air. Wow. Come on, nobody's judging you. I'm on, my, on, I'm on stage and my hands are lifted. I'm on stage, nobody's judging you. I've got the mic and my hands are up. The band is going to play. And with your hands lifted, I want you to begin to pray passionately that God will renew and refresh and return your passion. Come on, y'all build it. Come on, I need you praying. I need you praying. I need you praying. Come on, church, pray, pray, pray. Come on, with your hands lifted, won't you pray? Won't you pray?
Father, in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, God, we ask now that you will give us our passion back. Reignite a fire on the inside of us that will burn brighter and brighter and hotter and hotter so that we can be what you called us to be. God, we desire to be able to speak those things that are not as though they were. To be able to lay hands on the sick and they would recover. God, we desire to be able to break generational cycles and... God, we desire to be all that you've called us to be. But Father, we cannot do it without our passion. So Father, we repent. Because for so many of us, we did not lose it, we left it. We laid it down because it got hard and we got tired and people didn't accept us and receive us and people did us wrong and so we just quit. Father, we repent. God, I repent for going through the motions And God, we don't stand here and ask you for cars or clothes or a new job or for a vacation, for a promotion. God, we ask for our passion so that we can leap over walls and run through troops and not get tired and, and not quit and not throw in the towel. God, give us our passion back. And devil, since we know that you're listening, the very blood of Jesus, who is the Christ, is against you. And no weapon formed against us shall be able to prosper. And even every tongue that rises up against us in judgment, God has already condemned it. And we believe that according to Psalms 105, that you strengthen our hands for battle and you prepare our fingers to fight passionately pursuing who you've called us to be and God we don't wait to get it back but we prophetically declare I got it back I'm gonna say that again we don't wait to get it back but our praise in this moment is a prophetic declaration that we got it back no, I'm going to say it again. We don't wait to get it back. But our praise and our worship in this moment is a prophetic declaration that I got it back. Can you look at somebody and tell them, I got it, I got it, I got it. Look at somebody else, tell them, I got it. Did you get yours? I got mine. You better get yours. I got mine. If you believe that, can you give God the best praise? Come on, raise the roof. Family, if you're here and uh, you receive Christ through that message, even if you're watching online, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to text home to 28950. I want you to text home to 28950. Maybe you're hearing this passion that we're talking about and you're saying, man, I want to know what that feels like. We want to welcome you home. This is not a perfect church, but we are a church that is going to follow after God. And uh, I'm so excited about that because we just saw our pastor cancel what is one of the premier spiritual events in the country. Cancel the madness and say, you know what, let's show up for three days and let's pray. We are passionate about our pursuit of God. One of our core values here at Rock City is, is that we follow the cloud. That means as much as we may be prepared and as much as we may have planned, we're so passionate about God that we'll let go of our plan so that we can follow him into what he is doing. So if that's you, you're in the room or you're online and you're giving your life to Christ today, I want you to text home to 28950. Family, also, if you're giving today, I want you to be faithful over your tithe and your offering. We know that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. 
So excited about what God is doing through Rock City in a myriad of ways. We talked about Rock City prep earlier. And when you give here at Rock City, that's just one of the things that you enable us to be able to do. And I am full of faith enough to believe that God ain't done yet. That eyes have not seen and ears have not heard the great things that God has in store. Were you guys blessed by that word? I want to give God praise. Father, you blessed us to come in. Now bless us to go out. Father, keep us in the blessed place. Lord, all of you and none of us. God, keep us in your will as only you can. We step out of the way so, God, you can have your way. God, allow us not just to get our passion back, but to also guard our passion so that people and things and problems won't be able to suck out of us what you've already poured into us. It's in the matchless name of Jesus who is the Christ that we pray. And everybody who believed it said amen. We love you. We're praying for you. We'll see you in the morning for Devo Energy. Praise God. God. What yes. an incredible message. Yes. I tell yes. you, I don't take it for granted that right. God's presence is here. Mm -hmm. And we know where the spirit of the Lord is, the there Lord is, is liberty. liberty. And so to continue uh, to see the captives be set free, exactly. to continue to see people who were once bound yes, be set free. free. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Right. This is more than just a moment here. This is a movement right. that's happening at Rock City. And so maybe you heard something and you are now ready to give God a yes again. You want yes. to recommit your life or you're saying yes for the first time. The Bible says the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. And so tell God yes right now. You can do so by yes. texting the word home to 28950. That's right. We have a community here. We are ready to welcome you. We are ready to help you get in purpose, get yes. activated. Yes. Um, Pathway to Purpose is getting ready to start yes. next month in September. Okay. So if you haven't already gone through that process, yes, you can do so by texting P2P to 28950. That's right. Um, and so for you, Janessa, um, you know, we oftentimes talk about the importance of getting seed in the ground. So talk a, a little bit about how, you know, you've been able to sow and just the importance of, of doing so. Yes, so I've been able to sow, you know, just through our weekly, daily giving, yeah. the tithes, the offering, yeah. and just to see that it, it goes and it has a purpose. Like yeah. we were talking about our Rock City Prep. Mm -hmm. We, the students in the school, they yeah. need those resources. Yeah. And so just to know that when we sow, it's, it's for a purpose, it's yeah. for a reason. Yeah. And we know that they're gonna reap a harvest and you're gonna reap a harvest. Yeah. So be sure that you sow and be sure that you give because we know that we should have a heart to give. That's and so, so we want to do it for our church. So be sure yeah. that you give um, each and every time that you have an opportunity to. Yeah, absolutely. Look, the old folks would say, you can't beat God's giving, <laughs> yeah. no matter how you try. Yes, and even as we talk about sewing, we know uh, Pastor Mike just recently celebrated his birthday. Yes. So we want to continue to love on him yes. and sew into him. He pours out so much. Every we were having a conversation some, some time ago and he told me, you know, just how he prays for me, right? Yeah. And and not even just on the strength of like, I'm praying, like, no, I'm just, that's what a good shepherd does. Like, yeah. just the covering, even when we don't know it. And right. so when he said that, that really resonated with me. And so I just, I share that with you all to say that we have a man of God that even when we're not in this house, when he's right. at his house, he's that he is calling us. our names yes. out before He has a God. heart for us. It's that's for it. his people. It's not a game. It's not a show. Yeah. He really, truly loves yeah. and loves hard. So yes. he is praying for you daily. Yes. Yes. So giving back into him and yeah. giving to his life yeah. is just so important. So be sure to reach out to him and yeah. celebrate him with his yes. birthday yes. all yes. the time. Yes. So continue to do that, you guys. Absolutely. So listen, we are out of time, but we are certainly not, not out, out of message. message. We will see you all bright and early at 721 for Devo Energy. We got to do the beat. That, uh, mm, mm, that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So be sure that you subscribe to YouTube yes. so that way when we go live, you will not I miss it. it. Yes. yes. All right, sis, you ready to head out? Let's head out. All right, we'll see y'all later. Peace.